to it. Um, so yeah, the market we're tapping into is really to offer infrastructure you can utilize to build the build financial derivatives. Uh, we can create a variety of derivatives, but the most uh, common ones are are uh, usually interest rate swaps. I will cover a little bit of that later. Uh, but you know, this market is pretty insane in size. Of course, to move into from traditional market to the blockchain market requires quite a lot of adaptation. Uh, uh, just to get some perspective, which is around 540 trillion dollars roughly. Uh, these numbers are taken from uh, the organization that standardizes these debt and derivatives uh, on, on a semi-annual basis. If we look today at the crypto market, it's about 250 billion in size, um, and that's a fraction of the size of some of the biggest uh, assets existing in the world, right? like in this case Amazon, but Microsoft or Apple will be fairly similar in size. Um, and it's a fraction of, because a lot of people compare crypto to gold, which is between <coughs> 8 billion and a trillion, it depends on the size you take it, which is again a small fraction of the world GDP, which is about of time that, which is, I was surprised to figure that out, but the world GDP is maybe one eighth of the size of the It also poses some, <laughs> some risk in terms of uh, the size of, uh, of what can go wrong, and the ones which are more old in the room, that have been through some of the crisis, uh, know it can go wrong. Uh, but it, it, it's a pretty insane market, and it's a pretty, uh, some of the challenges of this market is this, the way it's run today, today a lot of the OTC transactions that sits on the side of the books of a variety of banks, like Goldman and others, uh, they're not transparent at all. So they actually run with some Excel file. Uh, we actually started working on some of the work I'm going to show here some years back, uh, when one of the, guys, the people who collaborate with, with Deutsche Bank, uh, and they showed us what they're using. They're using a variety of Excel, Excel sheets to actually work with uh, on a lot of these projects. Uh, which is kind of one of the things that also Obama was speaking about at the time, that you have a lot of risk into this product, but you have very little transparency into the size of it, and these things can actually be different from the risk. Uh, it's a different discussion. So, uh, so yeah, why would we think we can make use of uh, smart contracts for DeFi? Pretty obvious within this room. But the idea is really removing intermediaries, uh, the smart contracts are actually deal with the <coughs> platform, and they sort of run a lot of the risk management and risk profile inside it. Uh, it's very transparent, at least on the sense that you can see some of the exposure directly on the on the books. And you get a mutable handshake, so there is no question asked in the conference that you send. Um, one of the biggest challenges, however, with using these smart contracts are really security risks. Uh, and for the, some of the people here, I know Krishna, you're from a security audit company. Uh, and, uh, and I think there's a the most famous example of security challenges in the parity frozen funds, I guess, of roughly $280 million at the time. And the DAO hack, where uh, the, not the full amount was being taken away from it, but that led to the outflow of, uh, of Ethereum. Uh, but there was $150 million under attack and the Ethereum valuation around $11 to $12. So it's been a few billions at today's valuation. Um, and the interesting point is that it's really, really the, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, that's also one of the reasons why you know, a lot of security companies that we are working with. Uh, and I think one of the more interesting papers, you may want to have a look into if you have a look, was written by, among others, Lloyd Lou from Kyber. It actually covered at the time about 45% uh, of, the, of the contracts at the time were showing some little different levels of vulnerabilities, which is checked with Foyenta. Um, so, which for me was a very interesting point where I actually thought about it. Said, Really, this technology has tremendous potential, but security is basically really something you want to really be careful about. Um, and then that's what kind of led us to start working on the era, which actually allow you the possibility of <coughs> writing a few lines of codes, uh, a variety of financial derivatives. Actually, this more or less six lines of codes there, functional writing, which are actually pretty simple, natural language, are representing the derivatives you see here below. If you are interested here, said in three months' time, I mean, from this one to June of September, you're going to transfer, say, 10 Bitcoin to 555 Bitcoin. This is more or less the code here describing. We'll do it much more details in, in a second, but just to start it, because we just say, in this case, there is some transfer of heat from both valleys, and you multiply it by 55 and a half, which kind of set 
the exchange rate in this case between it to whatever Alice is going to transfer. And then Alice transferred to both one, one Bitcoin in return. Uh, we use both as a pressure to kind of tie both transactions together. Uh, we're going to look through it a few times in a bit. So. And then we scale it 10, so that's why it's 10 times to 555. And translate 90 days to say this code is going to be actually executed in 90 days. Uh, but we're going to look through all, all, all how this language is defined in just a little bit. So it was, it's kind of a domain specific language for contracts. Uh, then among other things I'm not sure if we mentioned it here, but it's been gone through formal verification and it's some of the stuff we looked into academically. But just a second before going into it, it even if we for a second restraint for discussing all the, the benefits of formal verification of the stuff, it's very simple to code it. You can see here that it's five, six lines of code representing a contract that if you actually written in solidity, you know it will take hundreds of lines of code uh, to create a, a, a simple future contract. It's also, I mean, we could even write it in two lines if we just compose them together, we make it quite spacey. Uh, and it's mainly because uh, we want to enjoy the benefit, which is one of the reasons why people use domain-specific languages, which is written like language. Right? Uh, so you can actually more or less read it. I mean, people may change the word translate because it's not that easy to understand, but it just means wait 90 days and execute whatever is inside. All this composition of it. And also you get a lot of the nice things from functional programming which avoid a lot of the, let's call it, bugs that could be available in other places like we um, Yeah. And uh, one of the other benefits by sort of deconstructing the language itself from the, from the solidity is that you kind of decompose completely your programming language from the byte code or whatever you're running it on. So we have a uh, constructed, which we'll talk a bit, some Haskell compiler that takes that uh, language directly to EVM bytecode, but uh, you could easily modify it to a variety of other uh, platforms. And also, without getting into much details of how the compiler is built, but uh, usually one of the intermediary steps in the compilers, which is creating some abstract syntax tree, is also very easily modifiable among a lot of these. So we have a lot of things which are transferable, uh, and also, it makes it very easy to transfer the code other one afterwards from the of, uh, blockchains. Is that um, Yeah, but before going a bit more into the details, we just want to actually run with you a demo. As I mentioned, if you guys are interested, we have a special promotion for uh, for DevCon. So the first time you will go to the demo, um, you'll actually see that one, which is just inviting you to. Sign in to get 3,000 Japanese yen uh, to your uh, Ecoax account. Uh, and we'll the cover. So, uh, yeah, but if you guys are interested, feel free to, to join. It's also not limited in location or IP. So, um, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, it's just for getting notification on, uh, on changes to the language. So, uh, it's an email list you can also ask if you feel that you don't want to uh, but let's look quickly to, uh, we started with the future of the, let's, oh, oh, maybe that's a bit major space <laughs> instead um, uh, But let's look quickly into how to create a future contract. Uh, we'll also cover how to create an option for contract. So the way we kind of start this demonstration, it's going to get more and more technical with the time. So the first part are very visual. So we're going to show how to create in this framework uh, varieties of contracts. This uh, is just sort of UX using the, the language. Uh, just before actually utilizing it, so we're connecting MetaMask here on top, which probably uh, most of the people here use or are using. Um, and can you, what do I need to show? Uh, no, and uh, if you don't have any it because you connected on the, one of the testnets, it will actually direct you to receive it. Because you can get, we cannot give you it on testnet, but if you put your address, you'll get it very quickly. And then if you want any other of the assets, maybe take another US dollar just for the fun of it. Then you can, once you have it, you can actually claim from our contracts that so you can actually return and run all of this yourself. Um, which one did you get, uh, Peter? The maker? The maker? Okay, so we're still going to have some more uh, demo maker in this case. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, and uh, let's see if I forgot anything. Yeah, you can go to that by going to uh, demo.lira.org and uh, feel free to, I think 
we also share this presentation with the organizers, so we have, we'll put the link on the demo link. Uh, but I think if you sign before, the only thing to say about the uh, promotion of getting this, your 3,000 Japanese yen, I haven't said it this time, is that you have to do it before, uh, before the end of October. Okay, so uh, let's start with actually building the first future contract. So we can choose an underline we want to use. Uh, let's use Maker for some of the guys in the audience. And we can put it against, uh, say, USDX or DAI, let's pick USDX. So it's bringing some exchange rate. Uh, currently it's from one market cap right? And uh, we can, say, trade 10 in KR. Uh, we get the, the USDX equivalent, so we're using, in this case, our stable coin for a dollar. And usually you'll probably run into it in one month's time. Usually the most, that the most difficult part is to prove that we're not a problem. You already managed it? No, I have to That's prove right. it. <laughs> Mountains are here, but I, I fail it all the time. Uh, I think that you're doing it really fast, Peter. Oh, uh, and usually you run it at some future time, as you said, you probably transit. Uh, usually when you check future contracts, the more liquid ones are one month or two months ahead. But we actually want to run it with you, so we're just going to run it for 40 seconds. Uh, and that's just creating. So we'll probably lose some of our MKR holdings as we send them once we have them up. So you can actually look into it. Uh, and once it's uh, deployed on the testnet. <laughs> oh, we lost it. You approved it? OK, you believe us that uh, we press the approve button, maybe? Why is it? I really don't know. It's kind of helpful. I'll try and move it away from me just in case. <laughs> Okay. Oh, you have done. Okay, so we we'll prove it with MetaMask. Prove. Yeah. And uh, then uh, it takes your part to custody. The custody is kept on the smart contract. So probably in a little bit, once the proof actually happens, that uh, will be deployed on, on the net, and it will take the 10 MKR to our custodian. Wait a second. Yeah, it's running. <coughs> Uh, and before we see to the Google, you can actually check the code of it in the backend. Uh, you could have, of course, done it before you signed it, but you can actually see the code that was creating this contract. So you see here, the first one is the address of the contract. Uh, in this case, this is the contract that transfer, I assume, the dollars, because of, there are a lot of decimals, but just because we use a lot of satoshis in the numbers. Uh, and then this is the dollar contract, it's from address and two address. And the opposite side is going to be trying to trade it the opposite way. Uh, and we have some limitation. We're going to talk about it a little bit when we look into language, but how much you're allowed to be taken. You can actually see that the tenant here will take Let's close it for a second. And once it's finished running, uh, it's uh, been fully executed. We'll receive this amount of USD in a little bit from the custodian. And then it's finished. Let's give it a few seconds. Uh, but in the meanwhile, yeah, we were serious. But can we go back to the code? I just want to show it really quickly. So in the end, we have the both commercial that takes both contracts on both sides. And we have 40 seconds in between. All of this is available online. There is nothing, it's no special privilege we had to run it. So you can actually try it yourself. And if you sign for the newsletter, you may also receive some different But let's move back to the presentation quickly and discuss how to build that sort of code. Uh, you may even have you have the chance to write your own code. <coughs> Maybe in the first examples we'll do it very simply, but after that we're going to show an option and then it's become more technical and I'll let you know if some of you guys want to skip the more technical part. Feel free to do so. So let's continue. Uh, so we'll show a couple of examples written in here. Oh, maybe I should use that. So the first one is actually describing uh, exactly what we sh we've seen before, which was a future contract where the buyers and the seller agree on a future price to trade it. And just before going on, uh, I also discussed it with, uh, with a couple of guys, including Yannick. One of the biggest challenges with showing a, a future that is traded in 40 seconds is people think, why don't you just cash settle it straight away? But it's actually one of the most traded uh, traded, uh, traded instruments because uh, a lot of people that hedge their risk, whether it be oil prices, dollars, or also speculate, the benefits of future is that you actually don't need to set up and put all of your funds in place. And sometimes you'll only, uh, you can actually use it, as, use it as a rule to do some hedging, while still you keep your leverage in place. If you don't want to have to put all of your funds, um, 
Yeah, so they're actually much more popular than a lot of the cash ad setters. It's about 40 billion a year uh, market. Um, but in this case here, we just show the settlement layer. So you may transfer some each to USDX, uh, and you agree on the rate for it before. So how would we program it? The first one will show what the truth completely. The next one is the morphine. Yeah, actually, sorry for discussing it, but uh, I put it in the wrong place in the presentation, but it's still there. Uh, one of the uh, reasons why we mentioned the futures is one of the benefits of building a system like that is that you can use the under -collateralization. So One of the biggest challenges generally with, um, I think, with, uh, and, and maybe in a lot of what we see today on the lending market, which is, of course, the biggest coin, I guess, market spaces on Ethereum, is that you need to have some over-collateralization, right? Some between 125 to 150%. Uh, well, most of it is because, you know, when you have to trust someone you loan the money for, they have one interest to disappear, uh, especially when they're just in address someplace. Uh, but if you look into this 125 to 150%, most of it is just keeping making sure that the money is there, is 100%. And then 25 to 50 is your risk management if you like funds. Let's see what happens if the underlying is volatile and you want to make sure that you don't require, that you can deal with a margin call before you actually have to close the position. And in these cases, a lot of time future conference, because they start with some sort of fair price, the beginning price could be easily that each is say $180, $2, or Bitcoin $8,000, 2000 whatever the rate is today, I don't know. It means that you can uh, only need, need the amount of uh, Money to put in your uh, in your um, custodial that would be enough to cover sort of the the cost of closing the position and the cost of uh, risk management you want to put inside. Yeah. So let's look into the code. So the first part of it is really simple. Alice wants to transfer it to Bob, so you just do it. Know this, and this is notation will keep to it. Um, it's a functional language, so the end operation. I haven't mentioned it too much when we started it, but I can have to discuss it now. Uh, we discussed the language has been formally verified, and one of their versions of Blinkit is to move from uh, something which is a non Turing complete uh, language from a Turing complete language which can do a lot of things, right? So we have a lot of benefits of using Turing complete system, but then uh, it also comes with a price. And what we kind of sort of the insight in the language is that eventually most financial contracts are finishing with a transfer or an empty transfer, which is zero in our contract language, which means do nothing. Uh, so the leaf operations in the functional language is always a transfer or a zero operation. In this case, it's a transfer of each from Alice to Bob. Uh, the next stage is we scale it. We say it's two times. Notice scale has two parameters. In principle, scale only needs to have a parameter two, which is how much you multiply the leaf operation. So it's a kind of a contract which takes a parameter and a contract. We'll go to the syntax and semantics in a bit. Uh, but the reason why we have two parameters is because the second parameter is referred to how much money you want to ask the custodian to hold from it. So in the example we'll do this time, we'll mostly use 100% custodian. Uh, this is actually one of the most interesting ways to extend the language, is to look how to look into the risk management integration, which is usually one of the hardest things to do. So it's not a simple uh, process. The second part is if we take, say, 200 and change rate, is to make a transfer from, in this case of USDX, from Bob to Alice, I guess 400, if we take it 200, uh, both sides. Now these two are two separate contracts. So if we just use them together, we need to approve them and repeat all the processes uh, separately. So this way we compose this with the both, and actually allow us to take both of them and also make it uh, atomic so the transfer will happen in the same way. Um, yeah. The last thing to do is we said we actually want to run it in one month's time, and then we take these 12 points and we put a month's uh, sort of execution and wait for it, and we finish the contract. So it's actually pretty simple, and in a bit we'll also look a bit more into the coding part. Yeah, so uh, let's take another part, go back to the demo, because I want to show you the option part, and then it's going to be a bit more technical. So if it's a bit, uh, so let's look into how to create an option. So in this case, we chose, say, a Bitcoin. And maybe we'll take uh, 10 Bitcoin for the, for the execution. So notice before we're running it, um, 
is that you have to have a premium. A premium is usually a cost of the options. We're going to discuss a little bit how it built. Uh, in a second, for the ones that are not sure how options works, I will actually explain how we work in more details. But in this case, we took about 4% of the cost as a premium to create the cost of the option. And again, as before, you're probably going to, you can try and pass it. You can probably run it one month ahead, but we'll take it in 40 seconds. Uh, so let's create another. So obviously the cost has been a bit more than the premium because we bought 10 of those, so we just multiplied the cost of one option in 10. Uh, great, so we wait for the deployment of that, and then we also can show the price in the money that you need to, uh, to, to receive, in this case in order to, uh, to break even on the cost of the, of the premium, and we can just start it up. So we, we added some sort of live feed, which is of course uh, not correct because the price doesn't go so fast, but we just wanted to kind of give a, a look and feel for it. So it of course takes the price when we started it, and then uh, it actually uh, sort of simulates some possible trading of that. Um, so wait for it to be activated, and then you can actually check your profit or loss in comparison to your initial position. We started with 4% cost, so it started with a loss on that side for the, for the premium. And then eventually uh, you can actually see how the price of, in this case, the underlying Bitcoin change. Uh, yeah. I mean, we simulated it to finish in 5% of some random work, so yeah. you can actually see it, but it's just to get kind of the feeling uh, of how it could actually change up uh, live, and you can actually follow the prices. Uh, and in principle, all of these are fits through some of our oracles, which you can integrate it, so there is no, this stuff could be live if you run it live. Uh, and then it settled it again. So in this case, you make, I guess, 860 USDX. So at some point, we're going to get it back, but you've seen that, one, that part before. Uh, so again, you're welcome to try it out at your own time on demo.zero.org. Um, and should we go to the GitHub maybe quickly? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we're going to have a, a small tour to our GitHub. Oh, you can actually press the link there. Uh, let's show that. So, um, yeah. But there's also a direct link from the demo to the GitHub if you want to uh, run it up from there. And you can see a lot of things here. We'll cover a little bit of the coding part here, and then we're going to run a couple of uh, code examples. <coughs> Great. So, uh, oh, again. So, I think this me is still on. Okay. <laughs> So the language is actually based on a paper uh, we issued uh, about a year ago. Uh, I think it was also nominated for Best Paper Information Systems last year. Um, and you're welcome to see it. You can have a link to the GitHub. It actually shows a lot of the specification. There are a couple of modifications from there. But uh, feel free to have a look. And also some of the motivation behind it. And here we can just go quickly below and see how the language is actually defined. Um, so the language has a variety, let's look into the, oh, yeah, we have some example of how transfers and scale work and what do they enter. You need to have some address for the, for the token, and then you have party one and party two. In scale you have two parameters, you have n, which is the maximum sort of amount you require to be all in custodial, and in this case you have also e, which is expression of how much you want to multiply the ERC20 token in. Um, but let's look a bit more in a more general way how the contracts are defined. So obviously it's sort of functional, so contracts can be creating other <coughs> contracts as well. Um, so actually what we have is we have the zero and, and transfer, which are leaf operations. So as we said, zero is just an empty contract if nothing should happen. And the transfer is a transfer of an address, usually representing a contract to one. Um, then we have um, scale, which just allows us to multiply contracts with some uh, number. Uh, we have both, which allow us to comp composite uh, varieties of uh, contracts. Uh, we have translate, that takes the time parameter in the contract, which allows you to, to uh, run the contract with some time delay. And we have if and in, which is something we're going to come back to a little bit later, when we're going to look into some optionality features, because it allows you to get some Boolean expression happen within a time frame, uh, which actually it's quite interesting how you do it technically, but it uh, also gives you a lot of ability to verify and put in functionality into space. Then the expression we have could be either uh, some expression or a number if you would like. Then you can have an operation on between two expressions. It's going to still create an expression, like 5 plus 5. 
depends on what operators you have. You have the normal operators, and you have if and or and n. No, and you also have the not boolean operation. And then uh, you also have observable. And observable is maybe not the best name, but it's a way to describe entering data through your operation on chain. So it's very similar to how you use oracles. So in our case, they are kind of the representative of oracles within our framework. Um, yeah. And of course, you have two types, int and bool. And time can be either now, which will execute something directly, or it could be with a different time unit, of seconds, minutes, hours, days, or weeks. Um, yeah, let's move a bit further. So, uh, how are the future executions scheduled? How it's scheduled? Uh, practically, or? Uh, I'm just, like, under yeah, yeah, let me try and answer it. Yeah. So, yeah, if you have, like, uh, let's take the, let's look at the future. Uh, can you, yeah, whatever. <coughs> Or you can even show it on the code that's run online. I just want to show how it. Should I, I can run an example of how to actually execute the future manual. Yeah. yeah, we'll run an example, but just to answer your question, um, you can execute the contract whenever you want to. Yes. And whenever you execute it, you actually move the time forward. So it means that uh, if me and you were engaged with a contract, because you know, uh, sorry for the answer, but you know, you know, the blockchain is asynchronic, so someone has to start it. I cannot just say let's run something in two minutes and it will run without another party running it, right? So I can be initiating it from outside. The way we build it was that whenever you execute the contract to actually run, which everybody can do, it's sort of very public, so everybody that's willing to pay the gas can execute it, it will look into the time that it changed between then and now, and, and the right time point, if the right time point has passed, it will take the price at that point in time and deliver the contract. Is that a good answer or not? Really? So I'm just trying to be I clear mean, if there's a bunch of future contracts, yeah. then when that time comes, there's going to be a massive amount of transactions that have to be executed. Or? Yeah, but they don't have to execute in the exact same time. You can so execute it after. after the time, and it will look retroactively. There is also the element of simplification, if you would like which means contracts are getting simplified over time. So if you would have a contract which has a time translate in the beginning of, say, 90 days, you could, in principle, execute it after one day, and if you see the contract again, then it would be waiting 89 days, if it was 90 days, because it would see that some time pass. It would still not induce an operation, because it's still in waiting time. So, so if you start with a contract that waits three months, and you, after one month you execute it, then if you look into the contract and say, okay, uh, the time actually is not three months, it's only two months now, and it will create this contract which is kind of simplified with two months' time, and it can be executed. Yeah. You can execute as many times as you want. But the uh, time is not existing in the distributed system, so what is there? It's just it's actually, uh, No, it's, it's, we can take the time from the block. Oh, the block. Oh, so you're right, we thought about it. So the time is relative, but then still we can actually patch it. So uh, maybe um, before okay. we show some of them, I'll let's just Peter run. The, I'm just writing quickly a uh, like future that will mature in uh, 40 seconds, so we can demo it. And then for this, we created a library that uh, you can install by just uh, by just uh, if you have a uh, no package manager installed, you can just write uh, npm install g lyra dash des, and then you get it already running. Okay, so let's uh, do the future here. So that is the, the one from So I'm gonna scale, so I'm gonna do both here. And I am going to transfer, so let's say 150 ETH from Alice to Bob. And then after after that, I will, at the same time, I will transfer. Oh, it should be USDX. Transfer one ETH from Bob to Alice. Okay. So this is just the same example that we've been showing you, before. You need a comma between them, no? Yeah, and there it is. Okay, this should run. So when I run the the, the compiler environment. We'll also create a local environment with a Ganache blockchain so we can 
tested without actually spending any money. So, um, so in the first uh, instance here, I want I want to I want to compile the future we just created here. So I say wait zero. I direct the path, and then now compile. So now I have an instance of the of this zero contract compiled here, both as a source code. Oh, I forgot to save it actually. So let's try it again. This is one. <coughs> so let's try again. Oh, maybe it's better as a bubble not existing. I think that's fine. Um. Okay. So now we have it uh, compiled. And if I say uh, I can write the source code, and you can see that it, this is the actual source code where I use Alice above as a placeholder value because I don't remember the addresses of them. And I can also see the bytecode. He has a question here. So yeah. If, if, if you, if, uh, does the type checking works for symbols as well? Uh, it's just uh, uh, these are just placeholders. So normally you would write the full address. Yeah. But in this case, the when you create a development environment, it will just uh, create uh, some uh, uh, test tokens for you and uh, some test accounts, and then. And then okay. just change them when you compile them. Okay, but what will happen if I use like if I write ETH with two E's? There's, there's no no asset like this. If you chain, that will deploy the contract. If you if you're using it on on the real uh, test net, you would need to actually have the address of the ETH. I twenty yeah, yeah. yes. But here we just run it locally. So for 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 so no one, none of us will ever remember that. So. For ease of uh, use, it will automatically replace the, the different placeholders with these, as you can see. So here's a bit compressed, but you can actually see that I transfer here the USG X, which is this. Just let it go to the compiler. But this is just running locally. So this is just some random token yeah. that you got. Yeah. So if I can actually just test the check the balance of the USG X, so I can see how much do the Alice have of USG X. She has a thousand, and Bob have, has a thousand as well, and and the same should be with Ease as well. Okay. Okay. So now that we have it compiled and we know that it can compile, we will actually try to deploy it. So let's do that. So we can just take the compiled contract here and call deploy. Boom. Now it's deployed. So you can see that it's now, this is now the contract address of this euro code. So the first thing we want to do is to actually uh, approve this Lira contract that it can actually spend money on Alice's and Bob's behalf. Because currently Alice and Bob still owns the token, so we need to approve it so it can be put into, uh, into the contract as, a, as an escrow. So uh, let's say that uh, we take this contract and then say approve. And then for, you can see that Alice has need, uh, need to approve $150. Do it like this from Alice. Um, just make sure that I actually have it. <coughs> yes, there she is. And this is Alice's address so from Alice. And then how much? You need to approve, and I will approve 150. And that went through, even though it doesn't look like it, but this is a success. So, and then we, in the other case, we take the, the bug, and here we just approve one ETH. And this is, is this going through as well. So now that both parties have approved the right amount, we can now take the future contract and say activate. And by activating, we actually it, it will then take proof the amount, put it into escrow into the into the contract, and then start the timer as you can see. It will mark the start time. Activate, and you can see it generates a, a, some transaction events. So, if I actually check, can my both Alice and Bob activate it? Anybody can activate it yeah. because either if 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 Bob didn't approve his amount, yeah. it will not. So even if 
every transfers or every approval gone, goes through the contract, but none of them does. So if Bob forgot to approve his mom, nothing will happen. And anybody can approve. So the 40 seconds starts when the activation starts. Yeah. So, yeah. so now if I check, yeah? I mean, I guess it's possible for Bob to kind of wait until there's like a good right. USD rate. And then if Alice doesn't want that, she would have to... But notice this, this is one of the reasons why both execute and activate are mutual and are public to kind of put the incentive for you to start it. It also means that if you are a provider of exchange services, you could activate it yourself. So if we offer, for example, an Torex, a future or an option based on Libra, we'll actually activate it directly and be able to use it to make sure that it's activated next blocks or so. Okay. Is it possible to retract an approval? Say you approve it and then say you actually so, don't want it? Yeah, you can if it's before activation. Yeah, so it's yeah. before Bob. So if Alice yeah. approves it, Bob does it, and Alice does yeah, I could, I could, I just made my approval amount to 150, but I couldn't oh, you you make it to zero again. Yeah. 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 And then the activation would fail, and not, no yeah. one would be taking off their approval amount. So, so just to check that the, my uh, approval amount has been taken, from Alice, you can see that she now has 850, which corresponds to 1,000 minus 150. And the same should be with, I check the, the ETH balance of BUP, it's 999. And Alice should still have 1,000 ETH. So now we can, we, can, we can make sure that 40 seconds are elapsed. So Let's take the, the same contract and now we can execute. And execute will check if from the starting time whether these 40 seconds actually has elapsed and if it, it has, it will execute this contract. So let's execute it and we can see some transactions has happened. And if I now check the balance of, of Alice, you can see that she has uh, 1001, whereas Bob should have 1150 USD X. So now this future has matured and it is now yeah, the zero contract. Hmm? Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, I just want to mention that at least if you have a Mac computer, installing an NPM is, uh, is very simple uh, and you can you run it again. All of it is open source, no problem to do it directly. Uh, I think we also explain the GitHub. Uh, but yeah, let's jump a little bit towards some of the more fun coding we can do together and it depends how interactive you, you want it to be. So I think uh, we're going to extend a couple of contracts and also give you some time to try to do it if you want to. If you don't want to, we can show the answers to it. Let's go with the hands. So the first one is, uh, we spoke about the fact that we want to talk a bit more into call options. It was nice to show it, but let's talk about it a little bit in more details. So again, um, in this case, when you have a call option, or it's correct for any option, you have the option, you have the obligation uh, to run a specific contract. In this case, you have something that is called sometimes K, there's a strike price. So if we think in this case about trading eaters with some kind of uh, dollars, and say that um, if uh, uh, you put the K to be 150, it means that if its price is over $150, it will make sense for in this case for Alice to enforce that Bob would bear the different in the ETH price to 150, but uh, if the price is below that, she doesn't have to activate it and she doesn't have to run it, so the value of it would be kind of zero-ish. So uh, a lot of time people use this sort of hockey stick, for example, I think it's more popular in the other part of the Atlantic than Europe at least, uh, because uh, before the strike price, of course, the option is worth zero because it has no value, but over that, it starts going linearly, and it's actually 45 degrees, so you get one dollar for one increase in dollar with the price at that point. And then, when we think about call option, we look into different points. So, this looks and the underlying asset price of maturity. So, the option value is any value over the strike price at maturity exactly. And a lot of time also when we looked into the option example before in the simulation on the demo, um, we looked at the price in comparison to the beginning price. So we look at something that is called sometimes the intrinsic value. So the intrinsic value means if you would exercise it straight away, what would it be worth? 
Of course, you can look into black shawls or other models to using implied volatility, so how you price it. Don't worry, we're not going to go through it today. If you want, we can go through it afterward. Uh, but uh, then you, yeah, we can look into that, but that's not the subject today. But the point is that we'll mainly look into the intrinsic values of those derivatives. So then the question would be, if you wanted to, uh, we're missing an eye. If you wanted to create that uh, nice uh, option, how would you uh, how would you actually start coding it? Someone want to make a suggestion? Do you want to take a minute to think about it? So we'll take a short minute for that. Um, I'll just give a small clue to start it up that you can see that it's always going to be at least zero, right? At least zero, or the price minus some kind of a strike price. So we'll give it a short half a minute to think it up. Uh, you can see the. Um, you want to maybe open quickly the, the GitHub to show the, the language fit? Ah. So as you could, if you were to think about it, you could think that um, at least in this case you have maybe two prices. So maybe you want to use uh, some of the cap capacities to use max in this language. Because this could be a very useful way for you to take either zero or something which is a bit higher than that. A little bit back to the, uh, so if we're going to the first example, so the first insight would be that it will have to be at least zero, right? I mean, if we didn't have a zero, if it was a deliverable, a physical delivery option, we may have only take the other part of it. So the other part of it is that we take the price feed, remember we had observable in the language, which actually is similar to, um, to taking price oracles, and our observable would be a price feed, that will take in this case the E to USD feed. And you can say what is that, that sort of, uh, if you would like, that Oracle minus 150. But if our strike is 150, this will describe the difference between this price that you got from the Oracle and 150. But you have to make sure you get at least zero, so you may put the max there as well. And then if you, um, of course, you want to make some transfer as a result of it. So that's the amount you're going to transfer between Alice and Bob in this case. If we refer to the difference between each price to 150 or zero. And of course, you want to scale it. And here is the part where it's get a bit more tricky because the risk management get into space. Because you don't know precisely how much will be transferred here uh, in advance. So you need to decide how much actually of the assets you want to keep in custodian, which is what you approved for when uh, Peter showed before the demo. So uh, that's the first part. So this will kind of discuss the payment you will have at maturity. So then, of course, you want to kind of move the time a little bit forward. So you may put some transit on uh, so as much as you want to run it far ahead. So this is how you would create sort of like a European uh, call option. Notice again, this is about five lines of code, pretty simple one and pretty easy to, to create. Any questions on that, actually, for a second before I move? Why does it scale 1,000 again? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it's because, um, so uh, let me take it in perspective. So this part was kind of clear, right? Because you say you pay either zero or the price minus the price. Then I said that um, you don't know how much it will be at maturity. And one of the interesting part is the risk management. And the scale doesn't have to be 1,000. It could be 50, 20, or whatever you want it to be. But in this case, we said we want to make sure there will be enough to be paid. And in principle, call option could pay infinity, right? So then you ask, when do you want to stop it? So there are two different subjects. On one hand, you would say, this is a payout that can lead to infinity, so we need to make sure the risk management is done correctly, right? Like in the maker system, right, you have the way of, uh, of uh, creating a margin call and to say it's really liquid, so you don't actually need to require all the funding in there. And at least with call options, which are actually pretty easily hedgeable, because if you hold one hit, you kind of hedge the position in a way. I can discuss hedging a lot, but I won't do it here, not to bore everybody up. Uh, but the point is that uh, in this case, it's, you know that it's very cheap to even hedge it, because you just need to buy one hit, in a sense, and you can lend some, some cash. But it means that, um, that if I was an arbitrageur, I would actually, if I, if I had a contract like this existing, and someone didn't hold, say, $30 inside it, I would buy it any second, because I know how to hedge my position with zero risk, so I'll just pick it as arbitrage. The same as you have in some other system, like the main system. 
Uh, but if you don't want to get into this area and you don't have a way to deal with the risk management part, you need to make sure that the contract holds money. And because this could pay infinite in principle, we decided just that there would be $1,000. The other side of it is, of course, that to make it more difficult for Alice because you need to deploy money to the custodian, right? So there are two sides for that part. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any more questions on that actually option before we move? <coughs> So then, if we wanted to look into a put option, and a put option will have a different payout, right? Uh, a put option will take the price, in this case, of uh, the current, uh, in this case, ether, and will reduce it from a, a larger price. In this case, uh, it works about, um, again, you have the option, another obligation to, uh, to run it out. And in this case, you sell the underlying asset for a specific price. So in this case, you benefit if the price of it will go down, right? Because you would say a predefined, for example, if you say the strike of, of it would be $150 again. So if the ETH price is below $150, you'll get the difference between $150 and the price of it. So if it goes up to zero, unlike the example before, you know exactly what is the maximum loss. So here you'll have like a different kind of hockey stick. So you know the nice thing here, I guess, as a user is you know your maximum loss will be the K or whatever was your strike price. Uh, and again, it's all linear on the other side. It can be used both for speculation or for hedging purposes. Um, similar to the case with the call option, the intrinsic value will just tell you the specific, in, in a specific time, how much value you will have if you would exercise it. Right? Of course, you have the price go down, you will have probably be happy to exercise it. And uh, you can also hedge it up and uh, use more complex models for uh, volatility. So how would you actually uh, call that up? I'll go a bit quicker to do that. Uh, do you want to think about it or just start a bit? Uh... So again, similar to before, you will have here the maximum of zero and 150 minus observable price. So this is very similar to the previous one. Here it's of course more simple to put the maximum loss because you know that there won't be more than 150 if that is zero. Uh, but you can still have some more partial market and then you wait one month for five. So let's take some more interesting markets. Let's look into American call options. Uh, so the difference between an American call option to a, to a European one is that in the case of an American call option, you will have, in this case, without a premium. We'll talk about premiums a bit later. In American, you can actually exercise it any time between the time you have it and maturity. So you don't have to stop precisely on the, on the <coughs> end of the time. So it's actually much more, it's while the features are quite similar, from a modeling perspective, it's a little bit more complex. Um, but the payout is again, in this case, the ETH price minus the strike price. So how would that look like? In this case, uh, you still have the same as before, right? You'll have the max observable payout at the time of exercising. So this is the exact same formula we've seen before. And similar to before, we scale it to whatever risk management amount you want to hold in the study. Um, but then the difference, and here we're using some other mot uh, methodology, use if we fin here. Because here we have a longer period of time in which you can decide to exercise your option. In this case, uh, say it's a month. So then you have a, a, a contract that actually have two, two options in this case. There is the option that uh, Alice actually decides to exercise it within the period that she decided to exercise it. In that case, uh, we will have the payout as before. Uh, notice that here the payout is immediately at the point that she is doing it, so you don't have to, you have to wait. Otherwise, you're just going to use the zero contracts, which we mentioned the contract side, you said zero is just empty contracts. Um, questions about the American option? What would be the syntax to have like 10 of these options? I couldn't hear you, sorry. Well, what would be the syntax to have 10 of these options instead of just one? This is for one option. But um, the, the thing is that each of these options is a smart contract, right? Mm -hmm. So you can, you can do it in two different manners, right? If you wanted just to create an OTC transaction like over the counter between you and me, and you didn't want it to be tradable, you just say, let's, we have this contract, it's just between the two of us, yeah. then you could just scale this by 10, right? That would be very easy, because you're the one exercising it, right? Okay. You have the right. So we just had a scale function here with 10 and whatever. Uh, if you want it to be very liquid, we might say, 
let's create 10, let's create like a contract of that or 10 of these contracts, and then we can trade them directly in some asset in a fraction of it. So, um, yeah. so if you're trading on the, how do you, like who's Alice and who's Bob? Uh, so one of the features we have, and uh, if you want actually, Peter can probably show it. Uh, so we created the, Alice and Bob are addresses, right? Yeah. So they could be, uh, for, for any proposal, it could be a smart contract, if you want to arbitrate it or just to play around with it, or it could be any address. So it means we have a way to actually change the addresses <coughs> under your approval. So if you are Alice, you could in principle send me your position. And from Bob's point of view, as long as there is enough money, it's, it goes back to the risk management discussion we talked about before, as long as there is enough money in the, in the custodian, you don't mind if Alice sold it at, at, at the side. So, uh, so these are just addresses that can actually be changed in the contracts when it's deployed. So if they're all in one unit, because these contracts are actually, I know it may sound a bit weird, if I don't know how much you're familiar with the averages yourself, but uh, because you can actually hedge this derivative quite effectively, uh, they can be actually pretty liquid. So what I'm going to say is that even if I was, even if I'm interested in, even if I'm not interested in this American option, or your European option. And that was actually the biggest, if you'd like, contribution of Black and Shells. The reason why it was so useful was not because people actually knew what the price of options and it told them a lot, but it's because it showed market makers how you can actually hedge these options. Uh, and this hedging is really useful because it means that uh, if there is for the options, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, then it's a great business to create this option and sell them around. So it means that uh, if even though in this example I put a lot of funding into it just to make it very simple, in reality you probably need a fraction of that. Because a market maker, even if he's not interested in say Alice's position, you can hedge it very easily. You can just borrow some money, take Hedge's position, and if he's paid thirty or fifty dollars to do it, it's a lot of money in the real world set up for, for taking such a risk. So what it means, it means that uh, a market maker can buy it and sell it in an exchange, for example like normally, or you can buy it and say, in the meanwhile, maybe I, I would like to sell it for an exchange if I get a good price for it, whatever a good price means. But in the meanwhile, I can actually hedge it actively with ETH and USD that I buy on Etorex, Binance, wherever I want to trade. And I don't actually mind it, because I know in settlement I will not make loss. And this hedge mean maybe costs him half a dollar. So um, this is why it's actually so interesting when you build these products over very liquid assets, like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Maybe if we pick some more um, tokens, which are number 400 or 500, then maybe it's less interesting because the liquidity of these assets is quite limited. But even if you take the downsides what Bitcoin and Ether are taking, you can be probably pretty certain that you can sell them within half a percent from the underlying price. Make sense? Or uh, mm -hmm. if you want much more information on hedging, we actually, I, I worked for some years with it, and so we can have. We can talk about it, but we're try trying really to keep it uh, clear. So um, syntactically, though, Alice and Bob would just be a variable that the contract controller can then send to whatever address. Yeah, I mean, it would be actually if, if, uh, if Alice is, uh, if I'm Alice, I can transfer my my position to uh, to another address, and then um, then you can transfer that further down the line. So, and that's some of the nice stuff, because when the contract does the clearing and the risk management part, it's very nice to do that, actually. So, but if you're interested, we can also have more, we can share with you some stuff. I think on a different section, and then we talk about future development, some of the more interesting part to take into is actually, in this case, it's very similar to also what MakerDAO has done in a way, right? They use, uh, in their case, Maker. As OMKR as a tool to deal with the risk management part of the system. So you can easily say there will be, and I think it makes sense for me, going back to Maker, that you're kind of setting the parameters of how much risk you're willing to get. You set the parameters of how much uh, margin you require, which in some ways hurts your business, right? If you offer people at 5% only margin, you could trade in 105%. Maybe you'll get more business than if you do it under 50%. So you can affect that. But you also have the risk management. If a failure will happen for the system, you will have to pay back that, that asset. So in this case, you can actually have lower margin requirements because it's derivatives. And within this lower market requirements, 
you can set risk management parameters to that. It's one of the things we are looking into. It. So I have I work both for you know work for Etoro and Etoro Exchange as part of the Etoro X Lab. So we build a lot of their product. But also we I work as a professor in the university. So there we actually develop developing it also a more theoretical sort of base. Uh, and if you're interested, we'd be happy to, to talk about it afterwards. So, any more questions on that specific example? So uh, yeah, now we want to add the premium because we talked before, and I think it was actually a really interesting development because we start talking about what are these weird projects or products, and now we talked about how do you actually trade these products. And of course, these products usually have a premium defining to them. Uh, most of it is sort of classical uh, math finance. I'm not going to do it here today, don't worry. I thought how you price these options. Uh, but in principle, not only you want to be able to trade this option, in this case, uh, a call option or American call option, you want to also put in the premium payment into the, the into it directly. So it means that our uh, hockey stick went a bit lower. Suddenly there is some premium because, as you could easily say, the call option that we described before and only positive into it, right? You either get zero or something. So it has to cost something because it's going to generate a zero positive payment, and this is usually capturing the premium. So if you take the intrinsic value of the premium, again you just minus the cost of it. If you remember in the simulation we showed before, we introduced a premium of 4% and then we kind of, the price started minus 4%. Um, but uh, here what you actually look the same as before, you'll have the if within, all this part is the exact same thing as our American option had before. Uh, but now we just had both and another payment. In this case, if the premium is $5, we just had a transfer or both actually paid to Alice in order to receive the rights for possible future payments. So it's actually very compositional. Um, I may say we decided not to do it, but at the time when we worked with some big institution, we actually were able to show that almost any OTC contracts you can actually build with this. So even if we would look into more, more exotic stuff, we don't worry, we're not going to cover today, like basket options, because it's very compositional. There's no problem to create a basket of three assets and divide them. And I'm sure if you followed so far, it's very easy for you to imagine that you can do something like that because you can do the expression part and you can also create adding a variety of things with both. So, um, the only thing to notice here is that one of the things is how you actually enter the price field. So if you guys want to play around with it in the test environment that uh, Peter mentioned before, uh, one of the advantages to use it uh, is that you can actually take inside uh, either a Boolean observable or integer observable. So we sort of created a way for you to deal with oracles in a very simple way. If you don't want to spend more time on it and you want to play around with it. So you can be like, create a Boolean observable like the exercises, as the as Ali exercise, Ali's exercise, and you create an integer observable for things like the Ethereum to US dollar exchange rate. And it's already existing in this environment. So of course we use Alice and price fit here to more clarity, but these are the names we're using in the test environment, but you can use the own name if you want to create it. So, so let's take uh, another example of a bit just taking us to the direction of more exotic, which is the up and in barrier option. So what it actually means, it means that you have an option, like we've done before, but it's only becoming valid if something happened before. That. So what does it mean? Take the picture before, we have a nice sort of call option payment. This call option would only be exercisable over this price if the price has touched a knock-in price. I'll go for an example and come back here to show you. Look at this, maybe less beautiful, but at least easy to understand example. Say that we touch the ETH price, and our barrier has been, if the ETH is 150, it's maybe touching 200 or whatever it is. So it could be that the ETH is below, like now it's say 185 or whatever it is today, but the option, you can only exercise it. So, so take an example. Say that there are $200 ETH price where it's actually getting to play, and, but the, the, the strike price is only 150. But the requirement for you to be able to trade it now for 185 or whatever it is, is that it, within the period it has exceeded the 200. And if it doesn't happen, then your option is not in place. Uh, these are actually pretty interesting uh, assets that are also using for housing purposes, not on it, but on other more traditional markets. Uh, and then, sort of, so you remember that there is a knock-in price. It's not necessarily the same as the price where you have to exercise it, but it's where what actually validates your option. 
So how would you do it with Lira? So the big difference here is that you actually just require him before you start your asset, and if between, if sorry, if within that the price fit of touch will be bigger or higher in this case to 150 or whatever it is that you want to put it, and when this strikes in, then whatever you put inside becomes invalidated again, right? So then if you combine them together, you can pretty easily create things like that as well. Yeah. And we added the premium in the end, but just another transfer. So, uh, CDP liquidity is useful. So I want to show how you can actually use it in places like some of the existing infrastructure. So, right, we can watch uh, what CDPs exist at any given time, but we can now actually create uh, sort of insurance on CDP prices. So one way to do it would be to uh, put in uh, a CDP, if the CDP is liquidated, to actually insure against that. So how would we do that? We will look in into some defaults that happen within a specific point in time. And if that default actually happened, there could be a premium that is paid. So it's pretty similar to paying you some premium if a liquidization has happened. And again, as this will be solved, you probably want to or zero if it doesn't happen as before. But if it's if this is happens, you this you get this payment, zero otherwise, and then you pay it in both with some payouts, so say hundred dollars to pay for this uh, premium. You can of course very easily to create composited to composite together and create monthly premiums for it with both of that as well. Question of that example. Cool. So uh, another interesting market is actually pretty insane inside is the interest rate swaps market. Uh, and interest rate swaps uh, will in a second connect it a little bit towards uh, how it will be looking in uh, places like the uh, crypto industry. Uh, but they're actually pretty popular. And the reason why they're popular is because we're all pretty young here in the room, but at some point maybe you want to retire. And when you retire, you hope to get the same payment every month, uh, you know, for your retirement. So a lot of the pension funds are very, very interested in being able to know fixed payment, how much they can pay. And pensions is a serious business, I mean, in the world. Uh, so the way it works is that they want to make sure they get a fixed payment regardless of the interest rates change over time. So an example, um, but you don't know what will be the rate that will be paid on the other side. So an example is you want to receive 5%, so Alice may raise 5%, and then if they pre-agreed on 4%, if Alice pays, all right, let me restart it. If Alice paid the variable rate, uh, and Bob always pay 4%, so if Alice's rate is 5%, you will end up paying 1% to Bob, because you have 5% payment, he pay by 4%, the difference is 1%. However, if Alice's payment is 3%, because the rate is lower, then Bob will pay 1%. <coughs> so again, we can uh, create a contract like that with Lira, to actually check the position element. So um, again, in this case, we say the rate is 4 minus whatever is the observed rate uh, by Alice, we make it percent, so we divide it in a hundred. So, as you remember the example before, we had said that uh, that uh, whatever Alice is receiving, uh, that she will receive 4% from Bob and you will receive the difference in whatever rate she gets. So if a rate is 5%, for example, 4 minus 5 is negative number, right? So 4 minus 5 would be negative, so there would be a zero payment in this case from Alice to Bob. Okay? So let's check it again. Maybe I'll just quickly the wall just because it's a bit more complex. Mm -hmm. So just to make sense, so we have this interest rate swap. You know, I once did it and then when I finished doing it, I discovered that the pen was not <laughs> deletable. <laughs> it's in a huge room, so I really hope it's not the case here. I haven't checked it yet, yeah, whiteboard marker. So we have Alice here, and we have Bob in the other side. Uh, and then we said that uh, Bob always pays four percent, right? Regardless of what happened, he pays four percent. But Alice's payment is a variable payment, right? Because it depends on the exchange rate or the specific rate based on the at the time, and that could be say three percent or 5% or whatever it could be, right? So when we actually model with Lira, we need to make sure that we don't actually know if eventually, right? Eventually what will be paid is the balance between them. If it's exactly 4%, it's zero. 
but in most changes it's not going to be. So we'll have either payment of something from Bob to Alice or payment of something from Alice to Bob and it's based on the exchange rate. So the first part we looked into here was saying that Alice is checking if the rate is, uh, is let's call it below 4% in this case, that she will have to pay some to Bob, right? Because Bob pay a 4%, if the rate is 3%, the net rate is 1% towards Bob. But then in the other case, we can make sure that in a very similar way, just the other way around, that if the rate is below 4%, then Bob will have a payment back to Alice. So it's very symmetrical, and obviously one of these payments will always be voided in any practical element, because this would be the mass of zero of the payments, so it would be zero one of them, and the other one would be the transfer rate. So either uh, Alice pays some dollars to, in this case, to Bob or the other way around. Any questions on the interest rate swaps? It's a bit complex, but sorry, go ahead. Can you model this using the if-else syntax as well? Or? Yeah, actually it's a good question. Yes, you can. And also, I was generally saying that a lot of the contracts that you create, you can see that you can sometimes model them in more than one way. Actually, if you think about optionality, generally, we use max. Max is almost always can be modeled with finish, yeah. right? Because it's a max. If something was over that, then that, yeah. otherwise you yeah. Right, so um, so the answer is yes. Yeah. Uh, but it just to kind of show that you can create some yeah, cool some more yeah <laughs> yeah. And then uh, yeah, then of course you may have monthly payments, so you may uh, return that you translated one month ahead, but you can have two months ahead and three months ahead, and sort of tag it over a longer period of time. Um, this one we are not going to show, but it's very sim similar, but I'm sure you can imagine it. That you could also create it cross-currency assets. So there is an easy way for you to create it from Japanese yen or USD X. And a lot of time, a lot of the, some of the more interesting, uh, take a picture. Uh, one of the more interesting ways to, uh, to create some of these uh, swaps are based on the carry. Because for example, we are now in Japan. So often the rate of Japanese yen has been pretty low on interest, and maybe dollar has high rate, or some currencies today have negative rates, like uh, Euro, Swiss franc, I assume Japanese as well. So you actually have to deal with negative carry, and one way to deal with it is actually to use some swaps to, 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 to receive and have some of your interest rates. Um, interesting case, you can also try and model it around some of the arbitrage happening in the DeFi world today. So today, right, we have USDC, for example, maybe paying three to five percent, and uh, DAI maybe paying eight to ten percent. So, so you can actually model a payout that you will know what the payout will be, and then if the custodian could actually invest your money directly to receive some gain in compound or instead up, you can actually make money on something like that. So, so it's a uh, it's a bit more complex use cases, but they are open to create them as well. Yeah, so. Yeah, thanks for bearing throughout that. We've actually seen quite a lot of interesting examples and I invite you all to, to look and actually build some of them yourself. Uh, last comment is that we talk about some of the ways we can actually build it further and that we're actually very interested in building it further. And if you want to take part of it, feel free to kind of contact me, Peter, or some of the team. Um, so one of the things we're looking into is actually creating a security audit for the compiler. So we'll build, a, as mentioned before, an Haskell compiler to it. But you know, we're moving from something which is non turing complete, which is a language. Because think about a language, right? It has transfers. And always it's finding time of transfer. Actually, the insight of creating this language was that financial contracts are at time always. There are a couple of exceptional of, uh, contracts which are not. But in reality, you have an option, it expires, and then it's killed. You have a future, it has expired. Day. Even if you take the example of swaps for interest rate, they run for a year, for a couple of, I mean, there is an ending date, and always there are transfers. So we can actually create them as list of transfers, which is sort of the inside of building the language. Um, and however, you know, when you create a compiler to it, this compiler can lead for some security challenges. So we are very interested in applying for the foundation, consensus, or other places for some grants to actually have the community building. Instead, so this is a truly open source contract, so everybody can go and it's as much ours as everybody else in the room, might as well. Um, and uh, another thing is to show how fractional margin requirements will work. Let's go back to the risk management part. 
either that can be controlled with a DAO that actually creates a risk management, or otherwise just allowing the contract to have functional, but then you need to in, imply margin calls into that. So that's made a little different level of complexity, but I think it's really needed if you want to use it for OTCs and other marketplaces. Um, yeah, we want to do more research on that and the functionality of that, so we're actually looking for some uh, research funding for that side. And uh, yeah, we have to improve the commentation if you have the stuff, but it's actually fairly good documented, I would actually say. So have a look if you have a time. In terms of the language, um, it's really interesting how I mean, if you wanted to use it, you can actually integrate it as part of your DAP. It can directly work with Flyra to actually get you a lot of the things that you want to run directly. Um, you can easily connect it to a DAX or auction to actually be able to create contracts which are based on it and send them out. And uh, yeah, you can create more efficient price discovery because it can also offer some other ways of liquidity. And if you go to our GitHub, uh, we actually show some of the things we don't have to run through it. But you can see some of the open issues that we're looking into. And if that's something that you're interested in, uh, feel free to come by and uh, share with us. So yeah, I think that's it. Thank you very much, guys.